Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started and a few housekeeping items first and then I'm going to hand this over to uh, Professor of Practice Dan Hoffman who will, who will introduce our speaker. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is the fourth event in our Kapla uh, lecture series. And today with us, we have Rosana Montiel from Estudio de Arquitectura. Um, as part of the events committee, I will be hosting, I will uh, be introducing the um, band who will introduce the speaker, followed by moderation of questions at the end. So please, as you have questions, type them into the chat and we will get to those questions at the end of the talk. Uh, I want to start, uh, first start by the land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous people. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and Yaqui. Uh, committing, committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to uh, build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships and community service. Uh, secondly, I want to give a little overview of a few coming up events. Um, uh, next, on October uh, 8th, we have Courtney Crossan, who's a professor here. Um, um, that is on October 8th, followed by Architecture Week, which is in, in partnership with AIA Southern Arizona uh, on October 11th through the 16th, and the State AIA State Conference, uh, which the theme is together, and that's happening on uh, October 15th. Um, also want to add that this year, our Kapla Lecture Series is working with uh, and providing uh, guests, inviting guests to, to participate uh, as they relate to our, uh, our P3 programs. And so uh, Rosanna is here and she will be representing or was invited to be uh, here with us through the Material Matters um, P3 program. The Material Matters is devoted to inquiry into how design can be informed by the materials and materials assemblies from which it is made, building on a theoretical framework of material fabrication. The group will engage uh, materials by investigating their properties, consequences, and fabrication techniques to build deep knowledge of the matter that architecture is made of. Um, and with that, I want to introduce a professor of practice here at Kapla, Dan Hoffman, who will introduce Rosanna. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you very much, Oscar. Um, certainly, uh, very happy to introduce Rosanna Montiel. Um, so just bear with me. Uh, Rosanna Montiel is founder and director of the Mexico-based architectural firm, Rosanna Montiel Estudio de Arquitectura, specialized uh, on ar architectural design, artistic reconceptualizations of space and the public domain. Studio works on a wide variety of projects in different scales, and layers that range from the city to the book, the artifact, and to other micro objects. Montiel holds an MA in Architectural Theory and Criticism from the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, UPC, and BA with honors in Architecture and Urban Planning from the Universitat Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Uh, she recently won the most outstanding architectural designs of Mexico Award in 2020 and the uh, Design and Build Awards organized by Build Magazine. She's also a finalist of Oscar, the Oscar Niemeyer Award 2020 with her real housing project, Oakley In 2019, she won the National Systems of Art Creators Grant and uh, given by the National Fund for Culture and the Arts and winner of the Sustainable Global Award for Architecture granted by uh, Cité de l'Architecture du Patrimoine de France. Uh, Rosanna is part of a group of young Mexican architects that have drawn international attention. Through each, uh, though each has a distinctive approach and body of work, what ties them together is a deep respect and knowledge of Mexico's rich and diverse material and social cultures, as well as a precise knowledge of modernist artistic and technological building practices. This combination of ground up and top down ways of knowing brings an authenticity and vigor to the work that is sometimes lacking in countries like ours here in the United States. We have much to learn from the young and old, our young and old Mexican neighbors. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, Rosanna's architectural work largely through publications, 
but I was not aware of her research activity, which is beautifully documented on her firm's website, which I strongly met, recommend. The variety of projects, types, and modes of inquiry is inspiring, reminding us that architectural research can also be informed by one, a wonderment about everyday things, be it the mapping of a worker's, worker's push cart through the streets of Mexico City, the formal analysis and construction of a piñata, an inventory of everyday objects used for seeing, a meticulous survey of possible common spaces in a public housing project, the delirious mapping of a city, documenting the vibration patterns of a thin pool of water, community conversations on the way to activate public space, the list goes on and on. An endless inquiry into the nature of things, places, and communities. In closing, I'd like to offer a quote by the poet Francis Ponge on the utility or usefulness of poets and artists and architects, I would say. He says that they limit themselves to transmitting to you their own emotion, their surprise, their wonder, their sense of the unexpected, the fatal, even tragic in the daily reality, an openness to the many worlds of things, the ability to see anew, to start anew. This is what I see in the work of Rosanna Montiel and all that she brings to the life of architecture. Bienvenida, Rosanna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. So I will start my presentation. Is it there complete? Yeah. Okay. So um, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this event. Thank you to the University of Arizona, to Beth, to Daniel for this beautiful presentation, to Oscar, for, to the whole team for making this possible. I am very happy here to present my work through this, this presentation called Something from Nothing. The idea of doing more with less has been a source of inspiration and a creative tool, and a, also a way of going back to the essential. So what I will present you today is how we have been doing in the office projects that come almost uh, from nothing where you can find a lot of things I can as as I say in a teach in, in a course that um, in a studio that we're teaching with Sanafrini that we can find a lot of abundance through scarcity and how scarcity can become a creative tool uh, very inspirational and very powerful to bring abundance so I would like to start telling you about this project that refers to the production of space coming from nothing but pencil and paper. So uh, it is, we just opened, this is a recent exhibition in Mexico City in a very important museum, the Museum of San Ildefonso in the center of Mexico, where um, I decided to mount thousands of white sheets what I call blank thinking sheets, to cover the whole walls of the area where we are exhibiting our work. And um, this talks and reflects about the idea of the void. How does void um, and the blank sheet plays a role in architectural design? So um, what I would like to, to tell you about this is the story, which is really interesting because we started um, putting like all the white sheets and then we were going to exchange many of these sheets to place the projects that have been drawn by pencil, by hand drawing, by, well, not pencil, by, by this thin uh, pen with more uh, around 50 projects of the office. But what happened was that um, we were putting all these sheets and suddenly the pandemic started. So the museum closed the doors and as we were all shut down, the museum was also shut down. And um, 
it closed for a year, a year and a half. It's opening now, the 1st of October with our exhibition. But while it was closed for a year and a half, I, was, I, I always thought what was going to happen with those sheets, what was happening with those sheets that were kept, because we really were like, one day it was open, we were ready to put all the, the, the exhibition and suddenly it was closed. And after a year, I asked the museum if I could go and see what happened to the sheets. I thought that these blank sheets were all in the floor, were really yellow. I, I didn't know what happened. And to my surprise, when I opened the door, I found this. It was more beautiful than ever. It was like there was a lot of dust. The paper had um, acquired an amazing texture. It was really, really beautiful. So for that moment, I decided that something should happen there, that how could I inhabit the void and how could I start like playing with these blank sheets, like doing also like recognizing the moment that we were living. You know, how do we, when we were shut down and when we reopened, how can we come back with a new way of seeing things? So I decided to invite it to dancers which could talk also about the boy. And I had to change the, the area where I was going to exhibit. So I had to dismantle all these sheets that are recycled and will be recycled in small um, drawing, drawing um, small notebooks for people to continue thinking about this blank sheet. And what was really impressive was like, I, I thought, how can we call also this, this new exhibition? Because obviously through time, it had changed. And as things has, have changed while we have been in this pandemic, like we were also thinking about how this exhibition would change at, and could also say something about two things, how to inhabit the void, well, three things, how to inhabit the void, how can we re, um, renew ourselves or see things with different eyes and also how can we think about the creative way on how we start constructing things so we this is like part of the drawings that we did we were um Many, many voices have been working in this project. Marie Combev, which is an amazing illustrator, has drawn many of, of our drawings, all the girls of the office, uh, the, the dancers. So I, I always think that architecture is more than just a, so, uh, a construction with bricks, but it's a social construction. It's a construction of a language. It's a construction of narratives and stories that we have to tell everyone and it's also about working with different disciplines for me it's really really an everyday more it's very important to work with different disciplines why because this all these different disciplines inform our projects and here is um while you walk through very close through these sheets they move so they have a voice and as daniel said like francis punch this uh poet that I really admire. It's like, how do we see, see things? Um, how do we um, see architecture through things? How things are also alive. And for me, these blank sheets were blank thinking sheets and they were alive, they were moving, they were inhabiting the void of the museum. And they really wanted to express something. So here are like, part of the drawings. And I would like to share this teaser. It's just the teaser of the video. So I call the exhibition Blank in Three Acts. So Blank in Three Acts, I'll show you this and then I'll tell you why. I hope everyone hears. Do you hear? Here. Hmm. I think it's not playing. Oh. 
Sorry. Um, it's not playing, right? It is. We can hear it. It's probably just the internet connection. Yeah, it stopped. Yeah, I don't know why it's not moving. Maybe it's really heavy. Or... No, it's not working. It might help if you turn off your video. Excuse me? You might help if you turn off your video in the network. No, I don't hear you. Well, maybe what we can do, sorry, I, I let me see if it's, maybe it's because it's really heavy, it could be. Yeah, I think so. So, I don't know. Why, well, maybe we can start the exhibition and then after I can just play the video or the, the, the sorry, the conference, because I think it's not going to play. Let's try one more time. He suggested if you turn off your video, you might get more bandwidth. Okay, let me try to turn it off and we'll see. No. Oh, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's happening. Well, I think I can. I can continue with the presentation and then we'll see if we can, maybe after we finish, I can put it in low resolution and maybe it can work better. So, well, just to explain you what this video, so it's blank in three acts because it's more uh, as a uh, scenography. It's, it talks about architecture, but it also talks about other things which I am really interested in. And uh, there are three acts. And it's also because what we do at the office is that we really like to act. Even though they don't ask, you, ask us for a project, even though whatever we do, we try to act. I'm going to turn out my video also because maybe now you're not seeing me, sorry. So, do you see me? You're not seeing me, right? No. Video. Sorry, here I'm, I am again and I put play. Okay, so um, blank in three acts has three acts. Act one is inhabiting the void, which is this the teaser of the video that I wanted to show you about how we can interact with our body, with uh, words, and with space. Then the, the, the second act is blank thinking sheets, which are all these white sheets that create a, that change, changes your perception of space through very simple things, white sheets, white recycled sheets. And then the third act, all with hand drawing all over, like it's a universe of drawings and models all in paper. And then the third act is a manifesto of the office that we have been doing. There are um, 11 points of a manifesto which show projects now changing, going from abstract to concrete, from monochromatic to, to color, which are the built projects. So it's like going from, from act one from the most conceptual idea to the, to the drawing and then going to the built, um, the construction, the built thing. So we can see that it's not just only white paper, but it, we, we can see what that white paper became, right? The projects. So, this exhibit resignifies the blank page by unfolding time and textures. The line is a vector that leads us to action, to the body and to the word, as I said before. So following the path of a line, one moves from the black box to the white box, from the void to the act, from the game to the creation of space. The paper extends, as I said before, to form a wall, falls into a maze of models, 
vanishes like the light from a movie screen to capture the mysterious moment in which an idea is born. So how, this is how we start. Maybe Gilles Deleuze says that no, there's no blank um, sheet. There's, you, you have to erase, but we always see this blank sheet. Even if you, we, there are all the lines and what we have to do is erase, but we also start with this. And we continue with the line to imagine different universes. And here is everything and nothing changing to a, another project. It can be showing this codex. So I created this codex where we drew the smallest possible thing and the biggest possible thing from the fingertip to the universe. What is interesting is that when we flip it over, as you can see here, you could only see the white side of the card. So it becomes nothing. So this idea reverses it. We play with something from nothing and nothing from something. And also, this takes us to the idea of void, again, you know, as a key element for doing architecture. How do we place uh, um, space, blank space, empty space? So the empty space, the in-between space, is what fills architecture. We create space through filling it with words, constructing a language. And to complete this idea, the best reference is the map of the ocean chart, which I don't know, sorry, here. Uh, on the poem of the hunting of the snark by Lewis Carroll. The absurdity of the map is that it only shows ocean, literally illustrating nothing, a perfect and absolute blank. However, it is equally useful everywhere, unlike normal maps. The idea is that you can imagine anything on this map as the ocean is infinite. So today I will share with you 13 projects of different scales, ones that are very fast to explain and that go from a book to an art installation, to an exhibition, to architecture. What I'm interested in is sharing with you the process that we follow in creating these projects. So through this, I'd like to convey the importance of looking closer. This is also very, very important for the office. Looking closer relates to the idea of having an active gaze that transforms reality, that has different points of view and also called peripheral view. This active gaze is being aware and finding content in context and seeing the potential on things that don't seem to have any value at first sight, as this building that you can see here. So this first project is called Look Closer. And um, we were invited to do an exhibition with many artists and architects to do an installation in one space of, an, of this abandoned building. So I was interested in creating from something that already existed with no budget and very little time. So in our pre preliminary survey, all, all of the uh, um, people that work in the office went there to see this uh, abandoned building. And they asked us to choose the space where we wanted to create our, our installation. And while we were seeing all the spaces, we realized that there was a hole in the wall of that room that if you can see right in the, in, in, at the end, that let the light in. So this became really interesting. So um, that sparked the idea of drilling more holes, as you can see these holes, in strategic spots to look at the city. The peep hole created a camera obscura effect. What I would like to highlight is that by bringing in an active gaze and an open disposition, the space generously surrendered the concept we would use for our installation. So you can see here we were drilling. So we, we use no money. We, we were only drilling more holes in the wall. And so we use nearly nothing to create this space. We hung a black curtain at the entrance to make it darker. And when you enter the space, it seemed like being in outer space. We even co cover one of the holes with an amber film to create a sun atmosphere, which that site was uh, led to another room. But all these holes led to the city. 
So it was really interesting because additionally, right here, we realized the cityscape suddenly started appearing on the wall. It was really surprising to see we had brought the city inside the building and we could see in the, in the, in the wall where there is this, the yellow circle, the words were starting to present as your eye, you get used to this light. We were starting to see what was outside. So it became a camera obscura effect, as I was saying. So we were looking out at the city through these holes, but the city was coming inside the room too. So the audience was invited to peek through the holes and to look closer, to perceive the city from a different point of view. So to me, the best way to understand architecture is to instill the practice of looking closely at the things we have already at hand. In other words, to acknowledge the versat versatile thing in the so-called no thing. So as a private eye, I set out to reconstruct context for the fragments that I encounter in the city, objects, subjects, situations, that interlock and intersect, sometimes meaningfully, sometimes nonsensically. They create textures, density, and atmospheres. So this second project is called Optical Objects, and it was also done for an exhibition. We started by collecting cameras and magnifying glasses, and we, we, spent, oh, sorry, we spent nearly no money on the piece. But we also reproduced the cityscape the lenses are grouped into different heights and concentrations, forming a space of relations like that of the built environment. Each lens generates a small distortion in the surrounding space that blends in with the whole. This is the way I see the city. Buildings and public space articulating different densities. So this installation of the magnifying glasses mirrors and lenses created a po poetical way to express the eyes and the gaze. When you play with multiple scales and layers of representation, fiction helps recolonize our sense of the real creatively. And so this relates with the city. This is Mexico City. So how can we be as playful working in the city? Cities often collect places and objects that have come to nothing something from nothing explores play stuff in the design process and forwards a methodology to observe architecture played out in context. So again, this is Mexico City, the place where I live, where I work. It's a city that seems to never end. It's a continuous landscape. And for me, this is the place to act. By acting, I mean using a methodology called side actions. Side actions, work through resonance. They are public events that change the local atmosphere and create a memorable imprint. This shift of attitude is the most far-reaching construction element we can begin with. In order to achieve placemaking, people caring and willing to commit to their public well-being. It begins with a ludic gesture. And here is an example of one of our site actions, a labyrinth drawn in an underused, dusty field in a marginal neighborhood in Mexico City. In fact, people from these two neighborhoods uh, never talked to each other. They were often fighting. So we proposed drawing this space as a game. Game for us in the office is really, really important. Acting in a ludic way is important to change people's perception. So if people were engaged in playing in the labyrinth at the center, they would have to talk and enter a dialogue. And the result was agreement between neighbors. So the fascinating thing about ludic side action, actions is that they can pop out of a simple chalk line. So we have to never underestimate the power of a line to redefine space. And these are some of the drawings that you can see where we translate. This is a Marie Combet drawing, which translates the idea of the two neighborhoods and the labyrinth and how people, when they gather in the center, were able to talk. 
So through, again, saying through very, very simple actions, we can change people's perception that it's something ephemeral, but can become more permanent. And um, the next project shows how just a single line, now a circle line in three dimensions, as a round wall with one material, you can contain emptiness and void. So these lines show the map of a pilgrimage walk, uh, walking route. For the last 200 years, each year, approximately uh, thousands of pilgrims from across the Western highlands of Mexico travel around the springtime more than 70 miles by foot. We were invited with Derek Delecamp to do one of the 10 landmarks along this route. We call it Void Temple. We were really inspired with this because um, creating this temple was more about creating relationships and how shelter is the primary action to do and how we can create shelter through um, relations. So these were all the circles that we were inspired of. And this is the, the white concrete wall that forms a 40 meter diameter circle, which we designed is a piece placed amidst pine woods that respects the topography of the site. We're just, we just moved one tree. We were trying to land this piece and to understand how the topography and how the landscape work to really take care of it. And so this essential feature is to be an open boundary and an austere tectonic gesture in the landscape that marks more than a site or territory. It is an expression of timeless space. The sense of timelessness evoked by historical circles of stone is due to the fact that their form is not bound to any specific vital function as this um, void circle. And, but except, for the idea of the very vital one of building significant relationships. Whatever their intent, these spaces were active through the bonds and exchange which set them in place. So the greatest task of architecture is to build relationships. Relationships are the primary shelter of any society. With them, proper shelter cannot exist. So relay, relating with this idea of the walk and walking through a line and going up and down through the highlands of Mexico, we come to this next site action that we work around the Guadalupe volcano in a marginal neighborhood called Miravalle, always understanding the limit between the city and the natural landscape. So we invited people to come for a hike and climb up the volcano which most of them have never done. Despite the community's proximity to the volcano, they had completely turned their back to the natural world. The height had an enormous social impact. Again, doing side actions with no cost, no budget, something very ludic, something very easy, but something that it's important to change people's perception. So um, for the first time, they said that they the community look at their homes from the volcano perspective. The irony could not be any greater considering the fact that Mira Valle in Spanish literally means look at the valley. From there, people got interested in finding a way to make a secure path line in an underused side of the mountain, what was what they call a park. They had understood the power of the walking line and the community joined us in doing some actions through lights. One was a 360 meter chalk line that draw the path, as you can see in the center. The second was a 360 meter light bulbs line, the first one that you can see in the image held by people. In this way, they were claiming the right to light the park. And finally, the neighbors were able to build a safe park with a lit path that was now much safer. As you can see here before, instead of crossing this line that could take them 10 minutes to cross, they had to go out and do like 30 minutes to cross because the park, this area was really unsafe. 
So how can a line can be so powerful to change an unsafe park into something mm -hmm. safe? And not just that, not just the line, but then becoming a recreational area, a public space, um, something that can be used really, really well, which now is gated and it's not used or underused because people feel really unsafe. So again, I say change begins with a shift of perception. Um, and to say, oh, sorry, to say here something important about the line is that a single line can transform a barren ground into a public area. The gesture of a line is inexpensive, needs little maintenance and has a lasting effect. Lines are ephemeral as they are permanent. The line is a vector or an attractive field force. What are the uses of a line? It can be a wall, a roof, a ground, a bridge, a slide. Extracting these very simple concepts can have great impact in social construction. So once again, we find abundance in scarcity. Here you can see how all these projects, oh, sorry. And here to show you how we continue here, we have been doing projects that um, were not only this re rehabilitation of public space, but how can we inform these projects by observations, by drawings, by small sketches in post-its that um, we started doing some small post-its and then it became more than 400, what we call aphorisms, graphic aphorisms. And we placed them up on the wall and started thinking about making a book with these 300 post-its, which we call graphic aphorisms, as I said. And the graphic aphorisms were classified under alphabetical entries of a keyword glossary. It not only gave us a grip on all the information gathered, but also generated a new language, which enabled us to shift from observations, observations to design solutions. So we decided to make a book, but it was not just a book about, as I said, about the rehabilitation of public spaces, but it was a book that had these graphic aphorisms in pink post-its. It had these maxims, what I call that are small phrases that are common sense, but sometimes we forget about common sense that it's there are a reminder of what we should do in a very, very simple and accessible way, but also how can we start thinking of creating space through typography? So as you can see here through dots, we can create different layers and we can create a city. So we created space through typography. And I think that representation in architectural design is not only a medium of conveying meaningful narratives of space, but also of resignifying our connections to space. So therefore representation is integral to the design process and inseparable, inseparable from the translation of an idea into a concrete form. We how can very, very, in a very simple way, in an essential way, we can understand water through these lines of typography or topography also, no? Like creating to so, so this book was done for the exhibition in the Venice Biennale in 2018, showing, which was called Free Space, showing our free projects of rehabilitation in public space. And uh, our project in the Venice Biennale was called Stand Ground. So we paved the exhibition floor with a one-to-one -one reproduction of the Arsenal wall. On the original wall, a screen projected in real time the activity of public space behind the brick barrier. As simple as it sounds, permeating the border between the inside and outside of the Arsenal was incredible hard to do. So in a way, we discover how, how hard it is to remove any wall at all. Their interpretation of the wall as ground, communicating public space with private space, and the walkable wall floor 
promoted a tactile haptic experience of space. It reflected on the meaning of common ground and common sense. On the one stand, on, on the one hand, stand ground opened the exhibit space to the city, conflating with the sea. It created a fluid space which allowed playful communication. The idea was to find content in context with very simple things, with almost nothing, just by removing the wall and making it the floor and by projecting indoors the image of what was happening outdoors. So as you can see, we started again here, like, okay, what do we have in the Arsenale? We have a six meter wide uh, length, six meter, six meter height. And we'll just have the wall of the Arsenale, but if that wall becomes the floor and it becomes a common ground and we see the window on the floor, then just to create um, an illusion, an effect, and through thinking that the wall was torn down and projecting in real time what's outside, we could really feel that we, we were outside and we wanted to be more outside in public space in Venice, having a beer in a plaza than spending more and more hours in the Biennale, you know, when you're really tired and you want to go out and you cannot go out because the, the door is really, really far away. But this was part of, of the idea of that illusion you know, that you could feel like you were almost out and you were really um, perceiving out space, in space, you were changing this perception again. So, So here again, I come with, with the idea that, that I just told you before about what can a line do. No? It can be a wall that separates, but then it becomes a roof that reunites. And then it can be a ground, a common ground for everyone, but it also can change into a bridge or it can also become a slide. So a line can have many, many effects. And this next project, which is Common Unity, comes from this idea of the rehabilitation of public space. And we designed to shift people's horizon of interaction in this project. Jalpa, well, as you, you can see, like this is what happens in Mexico City. We now do not record, we're around 22 million people with the Corner, um, with the metropolitan area. And if you can see here, it's difficult to distinguish, distinguish which is the city and which is a social housing unit. And this Ixtapaluca has more than 70,000 inhabitants. And uh, in this idea, it's how can we rethink the idea of the city through social housing? Because social housing is really, really important and it's really massive in Mexico. So um, this is Jalpa, it's an inner city housing complex of 7,000 inhabitants where we rehabilitated some of the common areas. So when we arrived to Jalpa, we found a fragmented housing unit. Zoning and access had been altered through walls, fences and barriers mounted by residents for protection. Can you imagine? Even cars are locked inside cages. One of our design strategies to free privatized space for public use was to shift the vertical, as you can see here, to um, the horizontal. The vertical are railing, walls, gates, enclosures, which separate and divide. And we change it for horizontal that are roofs, shelter, floor patterns that connect and encourage community interaction. We found it like this and we transformed it into this. The horizontal structures became more than just a roof. The shelter common areas we designed expanded the program of potential activities through compact multifunctional structures or kits that cater to all age groups from the clock. The place experienced as a system of courtyards developed integral low cost improvement of public space by resignifying simple materials. 
The flexible boundaries made the common areas more than a front yard or a park because they are private and public at the same time. Design spoke for itself. People will willingly gave 90% of the barriers and Halpa became a common unity. We also, in Halpa, we also recycled an existent space for cultural activity. There was an old leaky shed, this, called El Saloncito, that was already in use as a multi-purpose room for school tutoring, knitting clubs, and religious instruction. Our intervention brought out all its potential. A totally different space emerged in the same place. We kept the exact same area of the old one. But the use of natural materials, open visuals, and light transform it into a welcoming place. A patio donated, um, uh, sorry, a bookstore donated an important collection of children books, and the saloncito became a library. We went from a gloomy shed to a sunny library. As of today, the place is filled with life and constant community activity. Neighbors take turns to sweep the fallen leaves instead of felling the trees. There are outdoor Zumba classes, knitting clubs, chess matches, football matches, ceremonies, and movie nights, as you can see here. So any environment, regardless of its apparent lack of assets, has at hand a most invaluable resource, people. The new space facilitated a different kind of ownership and appropriation, one that habituates inhabitants to work for the common good. Through placemaking, we build with the community, not only for it. Our design substitute barriers for boundaries. Placemaking is understanding that the added value of architecture is activating a social construction that leads to non-discriminatory economic growth and development. Oh, sorry. So this project is called Court. And for this project, as you can see here, this is not a Photoshop, this is reality. This is what has happened in the last 20 years in Mexico, in the outside of Mexico, through this massive, repetitive, generic architecture, which forgets about people, which forgets about public space, which, uh, really diminishes the idea of social interaction and makes a big and enormous space for automobiles, for cars, for these streets to be humongous and forgetting about work and kids play, how to interact, how to, you know, like all these things that can lead to through this type of architecture. So how can we stop that? How can we change our idea of that? And what has happened that many of them, thousands of them have been abandoned because they are not close to any area where you can have um, services, where you can have education, where you can have transport, where you can have recreational areas. So uh, this is Veracruz. This is on the Gulf of Mexico, um, near the ocean. And we were working in this place called Lagos de Puente Moreno, which it's a social housing, a unifamiliar social housing where more than 25,000 people will live there. So the spaces that you see that are not covered with houses will be covered in the next years or in the next months, more or less to say. And um, we were given just a court, as you can see in the center, we were given that court and they asked us to put a roof on that court. So Veracruz, as it is in the Gulf of Mexico, it has very hot weather and it has an amazing vegetation, which is incredible that in, with an amazing vegetation and that everything that grows, because when it rains, it really rains. There were no trees here. So, if you can imagine, nobody used this space during the day because it's really hot. You don't have something to cover. And at night there was not enough light. So it was an underused space. So in the office, we are always thinking that these underused space are really spaces where you can 
activate them in very um, simple ways and almost with nothing. So we transformed that space into this. And one of the main ideas was to put vegetation. Today, these palm trees are really, really big. And today, all this space is covered with shadow from, nat from, <laughs> from natural things. So again, it's using common sense with very simple things. And when they asked us to cover the court, we gave them almost a community center and we expanded to that area that we were not given this, this part. And they accepted to give us that area when they saw that we were planting all these trees. And the equation was very, very simple, was thinking, how can we put program? In Mexico, what's happening is that they're building these arc uh, bolts and they have very, very big columns. So we thought, why don't we change the idea of these big columns, concrete columns, and we do very thin columns. And in between the columns, we put all the program. Even though that it's really, really thin, we put in between the columns, we put um, computer, a computer room, we put toilets, we put a, um, a library, we put hammocks, we put swings, we put like, all around the space where you can sit, we put a second floor. So um, here is where we extend it. We put an agora, we put um, things to make gymnastics for, for people. So it can be used by all age of groups. Even a biologist came here to talk about medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really interesting because everyone was interested. Now old ladies come and ask the biologist if they can um, have a tea to, to get, um, I don't know, get, get rid of arthritis or uh, they, they, ask, they ask many things, what can the, these plants can help them. And as you can see in this image is how these kids use this. And when we ask the kids what what do you like about this space is that they, and they, they, ans they answered, now we have a place to be at. And when we finished this project, we spent there with the photographers and looking at how what it was going to be activated like four days. And it was really, really interesting that we didn't wanna go out there. So we spent like the whole day, it was really interesting to see the kids that they spent the whole day there because they had many, many activities to do. There were Zumba classes, there were reading lessons, football at night, and even haircuts, uh, free haircuts, obviously who were the first ones to go for the haircuts, the kids. So this is how with, um, as architects, we, and as I said before, we work with people, um, not only for them, but we as architects have the vision of have the capacity of giving them more. So they ask us for a roof and we give them almost a whole community center. And this next project called Fresnillo Playground is how we have approached the landscape as the program where architecture works systemically by performing as infrastructure architecture gives back to the public realm. And here is also how the line can be transformed into a bridge. And this, um, this housing unit is constantly hawked by members of the organized crime, protecting their territorial influence from other cartels. So the social landscape is intrinsically violent. It's one of the most violent places in Mexico not only like in Zacatecas, that it's in this, Zacatecas is in the north part, in the arid part of, of Mexico, not only in Zacatecas, but in whole Mexico. And besides the social scars inflicted upon the young people growing up in this unit, the housing complex had a visible urban scar. This was a formal open air sewage canal that had been paved. And what remained was a dry creek dividing the unit into half. Although the canal was a well-flanked delimited space, it was fragmented, inaccessible to many people and difficult to cross due to poor bridge infrastructure. So as you can see, if you wanted to cross, you had to go down and then up. Imagine a wheelchair or, or 
yeah, or, or a kid in a stroller trying to, a mom trying to cross their kid in a stroller. And also there was this barrier that what you could not cross through this canal because the bridge was really low. So what we did was um, transform this urban scar or hostile border into an attractive horizon that people would feel drawn to. So we made a universally accessible bridge that opened an esplanade underneath. So you could cross underneath, you can cross up also. And, uh, and we built what we thought it was, what can we do with these slopes that are there? So we make them Agora steps, part of a play. So we constructed a whole playground program again, no? climbing walls were rain gutters when we saw first when we arrived there, were signified as lights. And this is how all these lines of color on the ground also suggested different activities. In fact, what was really interesting was that the most dramatic change on the cityscape was affected through mere color. We changed the original shrill, aggressive colors on the buildings to, uh, as you saw before, to a new earthen palette that made them more welcoming on the human scale and blended them with better natural soils of the area. Residents felt like they had moved to a different place, not having moved at all. Color gave them a sense of fresh start and made them feel at home. So playgrounds and youth hangouts are essential in bringing a community together. Children and teenagers are vulnerable, are vulnerable segments of the population that should be granted as many places for learning as possible. They are also crucial like, um, like Lalo, which is a leader here, he's crucial for the community as an element of social integration and, re and regeneration. No, 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 not Lalo, but, but everything that it's created around her. So playing becomes a sacred form of living and Lalo and all these kids led by, by Lalo uh, have like transformed the space into a place. I always say that space is more abstract and place is where we construct uh, meaningful relationships. So we always say that we transform space into place, into place making. And now, as of today, there are more than a hundred kids playing there where they before didn't have a place to play. So if playgrounds have anything to teach architecture is that we, that would be keep it open and simple. Open and simple means modular, multifunctional, easy to keep and to run around the clock, custom, customizable, expandable, pleasurable, and with room for plenty of productive exchanges and encounters. So to, to go to this other idea of what, what we have been doing with our social projects, we have worked also in a lot of community projects that have taught us to subvert the logic of architectural production. I would like to say that part of shifting our perception begins by making small matter. This pro bono project in the state of Mexico was to build the home of Reina, a single mother of two children that lost her house during the earthquake in September, 2017. Our design, recovers and reinterprets the raised granary platform space and the external hearth of the traditional rural house. So as you can see here, this is the space where the house of Reina was. And we had exactly the same small plot to build her house. So we decided that we should go up for having more space and for introducing spatiality into their, into their home. So the house achieves a thermal interior thanks to the use of the eco block walls and wood. 
All the wooden elements are from recycled construction wood scaffolding. This is how Reina was outside when, when the, what happened to, to her house when the earthquake came. And our mixed design is economic, but highly effective as it increases the value of the original property while improving the daily well-being, social environment, and economic opportunities of the family as a whole. This is how you can see how we build this attic, which became the room of Kalev and Edgar, his brother. Kalev has seven years. And one of the most important things about this project is how Kalev has fallen in love with his new home and now requires people to take off their shoes when they go up to his room in the attic. He has taken ownership and is proud of his home when he used to live in miserable conditions, no windows, no bathroom, leaks, dirt, no privacy, no materiality. So his change of perception is visible as he now understands beauty as a basic right. So how does a tiny home such as this make small matter? First, we had to work really fast. Catastrophes are so demanding that their timeframes offer an opportunity to work intuitively and efficiently. Second, we adapted to the maximum budgetary constraints and available materials. We turn a low cost construction element, the wooden pole, as you can see here, into our main <clears throat> structure, which was also very beautiful. So this small house shows how traditional can become modern and vernacular can be innovative. And third, small matters because it's a good way to prototype solutions in a model scale that can be taken to a larger scale. This picture was taken just two months ago, and this is how Reina has taking care of her house. As you can see her plants, her curtains. So the, 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 the house is perfectly kept. This is also another prototype that we did in San Mateo del Mar in Oaxaca, where we use the wooden pole as, um, as the main element again. This, um, this area in San Mateo, in the coast of Oaxaca. It's critical, it's a very critical environment because it has really extreme conditions such as earthquakes, strong winds, sandstorms, floods. And we did another pro bono project, housing prototype, to design a modular hexagonal multifunctional structure on pilotes like lifted up with palm roof and wooden walls. And um, the vegetation barrier planted around the house and its new orientation protects it from the strong winds. The structure of palm and construction poles is inexpensive and bioclimatically efficient. The home stays cool at high temperatures thanks to cross ventilation while remaining warm and impermeable under heavy rain. So this structure is used to sleep, to, to eat, to do different, different activities. These wooden poles were the main structure of the previous houses and are resignified from their original purpose. So what it's very interesting is that this exhibition called Nada Sobra, Nothing is Left Over, was, um, came from our, our observation of wooden poles. We display these ephemeral structures that master build builders to support the building construction. So they asked us in, in the exhibition to work with a masonry or a carpenter or somebody that work in the construction and try to do some, some um, to use some elements of our observations of the city to resignify them. And thinking again that we didn't have any budget and very little time, what can we think? And we, as I was really obsessed with these wooden poles 
uh, these construction posts are sophisticated as they are raw and honest. They're inexpensive, it's leftover wood, recycled over and over again from one construction site to the next. They are permanent as much as they are temporary. They craft the right balance of forces to support and balance the making of a building. So we decontextualize the wooden poles from the site. And we took them out of their context and brought them into the museum as a ready-made. With no budget and with one material only, we acknowledge leftovers as an essential component for project development and we prevent them from becoming waste. As I have shown you through this presentation, an active gaze takes the side of things. It allows us to listen to the voice of objects, to discover new possibilities within them and resignify them. So I would like to conclude with this object, the crate. Here is a poem by Francis Ponge halfway between crib and cage, the French language puts crate, a simple slated box for transporting those fruits that fall ill at the least lack of air. Crib, cage, crate. Playing with words is the best way to acquire a language. Similarly, playing with stuff is the best way to learn how to shape the world. A crate is such an ephemeral object, casts off as soon as it is used. But yet it has the potential to build an entire cityscape. But we only discover other functions and possibilities in a crate after we have lingered long enough with its shape. Cities often collect places and objects that have come to nothing. It's repurposing takes place after we see a connection between the scale of the object and its resonance with the scale of the city. So this is how we go from no thing to something. Thank you very much. Rosanna, thank you very much. That was, that was wonderful. I wrote down so many notes, so many just random Things I underlined a lot, and and um, yeah, the, I think this is exactly why um, lecture series are are so important in the, in school of architecture, uh, in schools of architecture. It's 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 um, reinvigorating, it's inspiring, and it's great to um, to hear all of these things, and 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 then just you know find again things that you haven't maybe considered in a while but they're back and they're relevant. And, and again, I just wanna thank you for, um, for sharing your work and sharing your perspectives with us. Um, and I'll ask if, the, if anyone has any questions, please enter them into the chat. Um, Dan, if you don't mind, I'm also gonna lean on you a little bit uh, since you are with the, with the Material Matters group to, to kind of jump in. And um, if, if you don't mind, Dan, I'll, I, I, I'd like to start with just one question, Rosanna, and then I'll hand it off to Dan. Um, and my question, again, it's going to be uh, a little selfish one because these are the things that we're talking currently in my graduate studio, where we're currently focusing on, on mapping and, and revealing. And a lot of what you talked about touched on that and something that I wrote down is, um, and if you can tell to our students here your perspective on how important it is to quantify and reveal the immeasurable, right? You, you talked about the ephemeral, uh, you talked about transforming something, uh, nothing to something, space into place. And a lot of these things are very uh, poetic and romantic concepts of, of, of just recognizing and seeing things um, for something else. So I don't know if you wanna to touch a little bit on that and, and kind of uh, give a little bit more views of that. Sure, sure. Um, so, well, thank you very much. And well, I think that, um, architecture has these both parts, the prosaic and the poetic. And for me, it's really, really important to always work in both sides. So we have this idea of the prosaic as, as like this very, um, how would I say, like 
like I have, well, I have, to explain it more, I have also this project about the subway stations in Mexico City. And this, this project has, has these two parts, no? the, the, the prosaic, which is the very concrete, the, 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 met, the subway, the, the, the routine, the everyday, the thing that you go with, but also this, how can you change this idea and convert it into something poetic? And we have been thinking about utopic ways of transforming these buildings into social buildings because it's incredible that there are 22 buildings on top of the subway stations in Mexico City of the line two, one, two, and three, and they are underused. And we're thinking, why, why don't we transform these buildings into something much more useful as public vertical spaces? And not only that, but also inserting all this poetic idea, you no? Know? Like it's it's how can we always deal with these two? And I also say that we we work with these side actions in a qualitative and in a quantitative way. So in a qualitative way, it really relates with the experience, with the sensorial, with the haptic, that not looking only, only through eyes, but also through our body. And this is how we move through space. Uh, to, with our body. So this is why, uh, oh, maybe I would play the, the, the teaser and we can end with that. I, I will try to open it in a different way. I just remember about that. But this is how the invitation to work and relate with our body in a different way or how we can work with reality and fiction and, and start creating stories. And I think if we transform these ideas like they're very concrete and very, um, rough and tough and sometimes not fun to work with but if we transform these these things into playful useful ludic things then architecture for me it becomes much more interesting it become it becomes much more um radical in a way of on, on how we see things i don't know if i'm answering your question or not but Again, you're saying more of the right things that, I, that, that I'm enjoying. And, and yes, you did. I'm going to hand this over to Dan. Uh... <laughs> it's too much for me to handle. As <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I, I, mean, I certainly open the questions to the students and others. I, I really don't want to, I, I, but I had one thought. Um, Rosanna, listening to the, seeing the work and um you know about about the tabla rasa about the empty page what's what's so interesting to me as much as you speak about that the social you, you make a little opening for the social and it just pours in you know you make a bridge you make a roof and suddenly that no space becomes space becomes a place through the desires and uh, of community, you know. So, what I find so strong and vital about the work is that you open you you open the door for that, and that's that's in some way it's always been part of architecture. How can it? How can we have architecture without it? But we. This, the discussion of the formal and the sometimes closes the door to that. And so you open the door and you fill you fill that void very very quickly and almost effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Almost, I know it's work. I know it's work. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, simple. Campaign. But there's something that something has been missed. You know what I mean? That it, that in a certain sense you found the key for, and then poof. Suddenly, there's 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 places and possibility and joy in life where there wasn't any, and it's just almost magical to me. Mm -hmm. So, I I, I don't. It's just a comment. It's just 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 a feeling. Yeah. What I mean. Thank you, Daniel. Well, it seems it seems very simple, but it's really complex. No, it, huh. it has like a really big complexity to to become really simple and. And more than the tabula rasa, um, I would say that the blank, the blank sheet is more like a blank thinking sheet. No, that uh, where there 
many possibilities where you open possibilities to withdraw. Also, what I say that withdraw is also a way of transforming reality. And it's really, really important for us to redraw because it's the way that you can see really and look closer into the details that are not very easily seen. So it's subtle, it's, it's there, it's how to make visible the invisible, how to make extraordinary the ordinary, how to open new boundaries how to change barriers into boundaries, you know, like these open boundaries, that it's not the same a barrier as a boundary. Again, the barriers, limits, stops, separates, the boundaries more open. It, it, it permits, it, it's, um, the boundary permits a way of exchange. It, there's possibilities. So, so this is always the idea. Well, I would say as soon as you make the void, it, it's instantly filled somehow in your hands. You make the void and then whew, it's filled up. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it seems like a, two, a double action. Uh, anyway, I, but others, please, uh, other comments. Yeah. Other There's a, um, a couple of questions here in the, in the chat. Ah. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of read these. Uh, a question is, um, my question is on the steps to entry and captivate the public to become part of projects, for instance, line through the park. Mm -hmm. Well, we, it's very, it, it has started very intuitively, really like, um, and it's also, as I said before, we have to act. We as architects, but we, we don't have to wait until a commission comes or until somebody tells us what to do. No, we usually go and act. And I think that Mexico has these possibilities, which are amazing, that we have less restrictions and limitations or regulations where we are open and we just go and act. As the labyrinth, we just, well, we told the, the, the guys from the government, but we didn't ask permission. <laughs> we just went and did it. And, um, and this is part of, I, I'm not saying that we have to really, and I believe more than being an activist, I believe in advocating, right? And, and, and it's a way on pu pulling forward all these ideas and, and going on. You know? And for example, it's how we engage with people more, as I said before, in a qualitative way than in, in a quantitative way. For example, in common unity with these, these map queries where uh, we were asking them, where did you give your first keys? Where did you play hide and seek? Which really works more directly to the sensorial than if you ask these typical questions of the sociologist that how many light bulbs are there in your house? Uh, how many computers, like these questions that are really boring. And so we have to go and, and as architects, we have to really read all the layers, these layers that are very subtle, but are, are very deep, deep under, to, to understand what people want and giving them more. That's what we do. And uh, another question has come in that, that sort of touches on, on, on a, a on something similar, it says, hello, muchas gracias for, the, uh, for your presentation. What is your thought process to prioritize on the user versus the limitations in materials and budget? And I think you just briefly talked about that, but maybe if you want to expand. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it's not one or the other. I think that um, we, when we work with pop, we, we also work well, in the office, we work with different scales and layers, as you said it first. We're always working in social projects, which is my main interest. But we also work in private projects. We work in um, always try to get grants to work in research projects and try to do exhibitions. And all these things are always informing one and the other and, um, and are part of like the critical thinking part, which is really important, then we, we go to the project. And I think that um, more just than thinking just about the user, we always think about 
that, that the limitation or that the problem becomes a solution and that these limitations are really a form to create, uh, to, to be more creative. It's a tool of inspiration, these limitations. It's a way of seeing a material that is useless to become something that can be really helpful just in the way that you use it. So it's the way of how we resignify things, how we give a second use or a second thought to things. Thank you. A couple more that we have here. As you helped to change communities and create new spaces that change the lives of the people, did you ever have self-doubt on whether the change you used were the most effective? If so, how did you get past the self-doubt as an architect? Sorry, I was reading again the, the, the question. Can, can you repeat it again because I lost it? No problem. As you help to change communities and create new spaces that change the lives of the people, did you ever have self-doubt on whether the changes you used were the most effective? Um, well, we, we work with, well, there, there's always something that I say that we, that the project is not finished when you end the construction. It's starting, it's starting its life. It's starting its, its public event. It's starting the activation of this, this space. And I think that what it's really important and we should all as architects do is come back after several, well, come back several times to the projects that we have done to see and to learn about them, not to see if they have worked or not, if they have been useful or not, what has happened to them and, and what are like to learn and to improve the next project. So I, I think that we have to work with, and, and I also think about, about this question that we as architects have the responsibility to work with uh, different groups of people. We have the responsibility to work in social projects and work with the most affected ones and, um, and try to bring the most out of it. So. Awesome, thank you. There's one more in there, the first one. It said, um, it says, hello, it was a really inspiring lecture. How were the projects in more dangerous areas initial, initially received by locals? Well, um, it's a matter of time and trust. And sometimes there's no time, but I think trust is really important. And I think it's very important to listen. And sometimes as architects, we don't listen. And we have to listen very carefully. And uh, I think it's not always, it's not easy at all. It's very, very difficult. We have been working in a project of a market, which we have been socializing and it's been really, really hard and they don't want to do it. And it's not about an architecture issue, but it's a political and social issue. And I think that uh, many times it's a political thing that has not, that, that they really don't hear them, you know, the like the politicians and they say something, but they don't do it that way. And, and they feel like really, so, so, and then architecture is also embedded in that, no, it's, it's, it, it mixes, it's complete, but we have been there several times, several meetings. And the last thing they talk is about architecture. And it's really interesting because I'm there to present the, and they're talking about other issues that are really, really important for architecture. And that we really have to understand that first of like architecture is political also. And, and that these social issues have to be work in multidisciplinary ways. And when they don't work like that, many times architecture fails. So, so we have to learn how to deal with um, the institutions. So we, I think that we're in the middle from the institutions or as, as we call from the top down to the, from the bottom up that are the, the community and we architects are in the middle trying to, to work with both and trying to understand both. And sometimes it's very difficult. They don't 
teach us that in, in, in architecture school. And it's not easy to teach that, but, but it's, um, I think it's a matter of, of being there and, 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 and trying to really understand that architecture is done by a wide, uh, or, or it has a lot of components and it's not just about designing. Thank you. And we have one final question. Um, it says, circling back to the children dancing in front of the wash bridge, has the opportunity for performance in social architecture been something that's prioritized in your design process or has it been a natural phenomena of your designs? Well, I, I, I like that, that, that question with the idea of performance because I think that that's, it's very, very important now with what I do to perform and to act in different ways that, that this comes with perform. So I would like to show us this one minute video that it's a teaser that hopefully you will see it complete. It's eight minutes, but now I will show, let me see if I can share and if it looks and we can finish with that. Do you see it everyone? Yes. Do you hear it? Yes. Do we hear it? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Um, we are we're we're left inspired and excited, excited at this uh, new friendship, and hopefully, you know, sometime soon we can have you down here for reviews or for another talk. Um, and so, welcome to uh, to our network, and thank you again. Thank you for everybody that joined us today. Uh, be on the lookout for uh, the upcoming events in the lecture series. Um, and again, Rafana, thank you again for an inspiring talk. Thank you very much, Oscar. Gracias. Bye-bye.